Okay, so the top, the main topic for today, again, is going to be tributary area. And what do I mean by tributary area? Well, tributary area is, um, there's a lot of different ways we could define it, but if I were to give a simple definition, one might be uh, the area from which load is gathered. Uh, by a beam column or a, a beam girder or column. So uh, let's explore a bit what that means in context. So let's say you have, let's say you have a beam. Let's say you have some sort of beam and you want to determine its tributary area or you're, you want to illustrate the concept of tributary area. So let's say you have a floor system that has a series of beams. So let's say uh, we have something like this, where let's say we have girders running vertically. And these, let's say these girders aren't carrying the floor slab directly. The floor slab is instead of resting directly on these beams. So we have beams running in the horizontal direction and girders, uh, sorry, uh, and yeah, and girders running in the vertical direction. The tributary area could be determined a number of ways depending on how we're designing a system. But one simple way to think about it is simply, think of this middle beam here. Load will tend to go toward the closest uh, location of resistance. And think about this piece of slab right here, right where my marker is here, or I'm going to mark it. Think about this little location of slab here. It could be supported by this beam up here, but why would it? There's a beam much closer to it right here. So um, load will tend to flow toward the closest available source of resistance or there's a term we sometimes use, a saying we sometimes use in uh, structural engineering that says load follows resistance or stiffness attracts load is another way of saying. So uh, this middle beam here will end up, so if you end up uh, dividing a slab up into where, into a map of where a uh, load will end up going, that, sort, that maps to the tributary area of an individual beam. So often it's as simple for a beam as just mapping out, okay, where is which, air, which beam is closest to any given location, um, but there are some subtleties to it and we'll be looking at those. Then you also have to look at the case of columns. And columns you can handle a couple of different ways. So let's say you have a grid of columns. And let's just say there's a series of beams. Um, let's just have a stiff slab, I suppose, without intermediate beams, like beams in the middle of the bays here. And we just have beams uh, framing directly from column to column. So how do we assign load to the columns? Um, we're gonna look later more uh, about slab loading, but think about how we assign tributary areas to columns. What part of this load is gonna be carried by each column? Well, we have a couple ways we could do this. There, well, two, two primary ways, actually a literal couple, I suppose. Um, the first method is to uh, perform tributary area calculations determinations and calculations on each of the individual beams, and then create, uh, for example, we could perform a tributary area calculation on this beam and determine that it has some sort of, 
distributed load something like this maybe. Maybe that's what the tributary load or tributary area load looks like on that beam there. And from that, we could get reactions by applying statics, we could apply reactions and say, okay, well, this reaction here is being supported by this column here. And we can just apply those at point loads. And we could then, uh, we could just apply those as point loads on the column. And then we could say uh, the total load on the column is simply the sum of all of the beam loads it's supporting. So for columns, there's two methods. Um, I'll just write this down here. One, you can use point loads from beam supports. And that can be used, but it is, uh, especially when it gets more complex flooring systems, that does get a bit cumbersome. So often what we tend to use more is to just assign tributary areas directly to the columns. So instead of calculate, because ultimately if you trace through it, that's what you're ultimately doing. So what you can do instead is just use tributary areas for columns. So if you have a flat floor slab, what you might do is simply divide the slab um, into zones representing the closest columns. So basically what you'd be doing is divide, is drawing uh, lines halfway between each column line. So say this, there's this column line here and this column line here, and you divide, a, if you would make mark a dividing line halfway between. Same thing here and here. Oh, not that one. That's not right. Don't draw on the column lines themselves. Sorry about that. Oh, my pretty drawing is all, all messed up. <laughs> anyway. Mm. That is a beam line, not a dividing line. So again, we would just draw lines at the points halfway between individual columns. So we can see then that the tributary, we can then map these to the tributary area of individual columns. So this corner column here would support this area here. And that's all that would be going to that particular column. This column here, so maybe I would just put a little arrow to that. In contrast, this one here, um, maybe I'll use blue. This one here might have that tributary area there. Again, the, so you're uh, so using this method, the second method is to use uh, direct tributary areas on columns. So direct column tributary area. And this is probably gonna be more convenient. I'd recommend using that one uh, when you can. Okay, so that's conceptually what we're gonna be doing. And uh, next I wanna look at uh, slab loading. Um, look at the difference between one-way slabs, one-way slab loading and two-way slab loading. Uh, any questions so far? Okay. So again, we're going to be looking at one-way slab loading versus two-way slab loading and discussing what exactly that means first, and then looking at how to, um, some rules of thumb, when to break those up, when to load them differently, when to use one-way slab loading versus when to use two-way slab loading.
let's consider one-way versus two-way loading. So ultimately, when we're uh, when we are assigning load, when we're assigning uh, and 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 of course, in context, if it's not clear, what I'm talking about here are vertical loads. I am talking about uh, gravity loads, including dead load and live load, also snow load and rain load. Although in this course, we're going to be focusing primarily working primarily with live load and dead load. Um, but any vertical area load is going to be handled the same way, like this. Um, but there's a couple different ways you can distribute load. So let's look at one way loading first. So let's say you have, um, let's say you have some beams, a uh, beam, beam, a girder, and a girder. Girder, lovely. Okay, so if we treat our girders as true ideal girders, then I suppose maybe they're not actually carrying any uh, load directly from the slab. So let's say the girders aren't actually carrying any of the slab weight. In other words, uh, if we were to look at this vertically or look at this in elevation view, we would have something like this, where we have the slab and then we have the beams periodically supporting the slab. And then for simplicity's sake, I could show connections that would be more realistic, but for simplicity's sake, let's imagine that the girders are, uh, the, this that we have a beam here, um, a slab, and then uh, girders, like so. So notice that the beam is, the beams are what are actually carrying the slab. Uh, directly. And then the at no point then will the girders actually support uh, support line loads from the slab. Rather, the girders will only carry point loads periodically wherever there's one of these interstitial beams that frames into them. Now, like I said, you, these wouldn't, in reality, wouldn't have beams resting directly on them. There would be some sort of connection detail, like a pin connection or something connecting the, the web of one to the web of another. But uh, for simplicity's sake, to illustrate the concept, you can think of them as resting directly on top of them. So for one-way loading, the key is that uh, load is only distributed in one direction. So what I mean by this is that the girders do not carry any load whatsoever. Instead, you draw you would simply divide a or draw a dividing line halfway between each beam and map them um, and apply the load uh, half to each beam. So in case it's not clear, let me illustrate what I mean by this. In case it's not clear what I mean by uh, distribute the load, let me illustrate what I mean by this for simple calculation. One downside of this light board, it is a bit harder to keep clean than a conventional light board, but I think it's worth it. Okay. And this example is going to, and, and this example is going to really illustrate how we transform area loads uh, into um, 
into distributed loads or into line loads, I should say. So let's say we have something like this. Let's say we have a slab with a dead load equal to, I don't know, 100 PSF. That represents just the dead weight of the slab itself. And then let's say we have a beam, a beam here and a beam here. So here we have beam. And then let's say maybe in blue, we have a couple girders that are just supporting the, uh, that are just supporting the girders via point loads. And then you have girder. And I'll also wanna put some reactions on here or dimensions on here. Um, also let's say the uh, beams, oh, let's say they weigh, I don't know, five pounds per foot. So really light beams. Uh, let's do that. And then let's say uh, the girders, um, hmm. let's make them, I don't know, 10 pounds per foot. So the girders, are, let's say those are 10 pounds per foot. So again, we're still in the one-way uh, loading regime. So let's look at how, uh, let's distribute, let's first distribute the slab load onto the, onto the beams. Step one, distribute slab load onto beams. So, oh, and we do need some dimensions on here. So let's go ahead and mix some dimensions up. Oh, let's say it's, uh, the dimensions are maybe, oh no, that's not gonna work. Let's say 15 feet um, by 30 feet. Wow, this, there was not enough room for dim lines in here. So it is 30 feet long and 15 feet wide. Okay. So, um, and also let's just say there are is, uh, this is the only structure, no other bays. And so we want, and again, we're trying to find the load diagrams for the beams and the girders. And let's say this is all the structure that exists. And there would be columns in the corners that we could also calculate the um, point loads for. So there's no other bays. There's not, it's not like we have a whole giant grid of columns. It's literally just this. This is all we need to consider. So um, let's think about this. This beam is going to be 30 feet long. That's, that's uh, fair enough. Um, but think about how wide the tributary zone is for each of these beams. Well, if we divide, if we, we can simply divide 15 feet by two, and that will be 7.5 feet. So the distributed load on each of the columns, or sorry, on each of the beams is going to be our dead load of 100 PSF. And again, I'm only working with dead load right here. I'm not working with the live load, right? Any live load right now. So 100 PSF times our tributary width of 7.5 feet. And that would then give us a, uh, a linear uh, distributed load or a line load of 750 pounds per foot. So live loads, dead loads, et cetera, we usually calculate these as area loads, pounds per square foot. And when, but when designing beams, if you remember back from mechanics, when you're designing beams, if you wanna calculate deflection, if you wanna calculate moment and shear and things like that, beams are linear elements. So you ultimately need a, um, a distributed load, a linear distributed load in pounds per foot. And multiplying the uh, area load by the tributary width, the 7.5 feet, gives that to us. And so if I were to draw a load diagram of the beam, it would look like this. We would simply have a constant value all the way along the beam at 750 pounds per foot. And this thing would then be 30 feet long. And there would be a couple of reactions. And to get those reactions, those would be simple vertical reactions at the end. 
And so we can assume symmetry and just say, we can apply symmetry and just say 750 pounds per foot times 30 feet divided by two. Or if you wanted to be more, uh, more uh, rigorous, you could do a sum of forces in the vertical direction. You could do a balance of moments. You could do any of the things you learn in statics. And so let me see if that comes to you. Let's see, 750 times 30 divided by two. And I get 11.25 kips, converting the uh, pounds to kips. And we would have the same thing over here. Then if we wanted to distribute the, uh, and then if we wanted to apply uh, the uh, point, the, if we wanted to look at the, the uh, load diagrams of the girders, there wouldn't be any uh, slab load on those. There would only be the point loads from the columns, or sorry, from the beams. Too many markers. Where is my blue marker? Okay, there we go. So for girders, the girders in turn would only be supporting if the girders are like this, something like that, the girders in turn, depending uh, how long they are, et cetera, would be supporting these uh, reactions from the beams of 11.25 kips. So we would have something like this. We would not have any distributed load along the girders, but we would have our reactions like this, of 11.25 kips, 11.25 kips. And if this was a larger grid, and I suppose I should have something like, I should probably, since I said this was all the structure that we have, I suppose I should draw the girders as simply terminating at the locations of the point loads. So we have, um, I'll, I'll just draw it as a simple uh, line element. So you would have two point loads of 11.25 kips, separated by a distance of uh, 15 feet here. Okay, so that's the basic idea of one-way slab loading. We are simply, uh, we are saying that uh, load only flows in one direction. That's why it's called one-way slab loading. And we're simply dividing um, the area between two beams and two and assigning, uh, and, and when I say, again, when I say assigning, what I'm really talking about is using is determining a tributary width. And that concept works well for one-way slab loading. Any questions so far? Okay. Uh, so next I wanna look at two-way slab loading. So two-way slab loading is uh, a little bit trickier, but not too bad still. It's um, what you're dealing with more is uh, there, are, there are two axes that we can assign load to. So because of that, we end up with, we can end up with some interesting triangular or trapezoidal loads. Or triangular trapezoidal load diagrams. All right, so next let's consider two-way uh, slab loading.
In this type of loading, we assume that uh, assume the entire perimeter of a slab can carry load. So let's say you have something like this. Let's say you have a squarish slab. Now, if we are doing a one-way loading, we might specify that only the top or the bottom or the left and the right beams would actually carry any load. And so if this was one way, we would divide it like this. And half the load would go to the beam on the left and half the load would go to the beam on the right. However, if we have two-way loading, we assume that all uh, of the beams in per, on the perimeter, like there are beams, we assume there are beams all along the perimeter of the slab, or if you have a more complex uh, column grid, you'll assume that there are um, beams between every column and each one of those can carry uh, distributed load or can gather load. So you'd end up with something more like this. Okay, think about this for a moment. Um, if let's say this is a square slab exactly. So if this was a square slab, um, think about for a moment how you divide this up evenly. Well, if you, and again, when I say dividing up evenly, what I want to do is I want on any given point on this slab, I want to assign that bit of load to the closest beam. So if I just put my finger somewhere on the slab and I figure out, okay, and I don't wanna figure out what beam it goes to. Well, let's see, this point here would have to go to the beam up here. This point here would have to go to this point here. This point here would have to go to this point here. Um, in the middle, I would be fairly confused. So I know I have to have a, like if I'm right in the middle of that square slab, I don't know where that, uh, where that load should go to. So I definitely need a point on that dividing line there. And there are some other points of confusion. What if I'm like, halfway between at this angle between um, the, the left and the, uh, or sorry, the right and the bottom beam. Well, that's also a bit confusing. So you can kind of immediately see how our dividing lines are going to be formed. I can manage to draw a straight line. These will be at 45 degree angles. Uh, assuming, of course, that your beams meet at 90 degree angles, which they will, uh, in most cases in uh, real design, not always, I suppose, but at least in this class, you'll only see, be seeing beams intersecting at 90 degree angles, so you can use 45. Otherwise, if you if you did have some wacky slab that was like that's like a parallelogram, uh, just use a little trigonometry to figure out what that whatever your dividing angles will be. So because of this, your two-way slabs get interesting. Um, triangular and trapezoidal areas, tributary areas. So you'll end up with something kind of like this. You have a beam and you'll end up with something like this, a triangular load. Okay, so let's look at an example of this. I wanna look at how to get the load diagram for a, let's start with a simple square slab first. And then we'll discuss, uh, after we look at square slabs, we'll look at rectangular two-way slabs, and then we'll look at how do you determine whether you have a one-way slab or a two-way slab. Okay, let's look. So let's look at an example of a simple two-way slab. 
And let's say we have a slab that has beams on all four sides. And let's say, uh, oh, I don't know, let's make this 20 feet by 20 feet. And to make this interesting, uh, let's say that there is a column, or sorry, a slab. Let's say the slab is, oh, I don't know, let's make it, uh, hmm. let's make it interesting and say it's 14 inches thick of normal weight concrete. That's what counts as interesting in my day. <laughs> anyway, that's how interesting I am. That counts as interesting. Anyway, let's see either here nor there. So the first thing we we'll wanna do is find a distributed area load. So a dead load, for example, would be a P dead for, a I tend to use P's for pressure loads, distributed loads. So for the slab itself, you might have something like 14 inches thickness, and we need to convert that to feet thick, a thickness in feet. So I'd multiply by one foot divided by 12 inches. And then I would multiply by the specific weight of concrete, which we learned last time was 150 pounds per cubic foot, assuming normal weight concrete. Now, some lightweight concretes can go much lighter than this. Uh, some particularly strong concretes, you might end up slightly higher than that if you have a very low water to cement ratio. But a good rule of thumb, unless you have any other, unless you don't have any other information, for normal reinforced concrete is 150 pounds per cubic foot. Okay. And looking at the units, we'll end up with feet uh, in our length. And then multiplying that, we'll you'll get a value in pounds per foot or pounds per square foot. So let's go ahead and multiply this out. So 14 divided by 12 times 150. And I get uh, that is 175 uh, pounds per square foot. That is 175 pounds per square foot. And again, think about what this represents physically. This is a dead load of the slab um, without any kind of load combinations of factors of safety, resistance factors, whatever applied. This is, in other words, if I went to this building and with a saw, literally cut out, you know, the big concrete saw, I literally sawed out a one foot by one foot section of this slab. And, oh, there's no way I could lift that. But let's say I could. Um, if I drag this thing um, into the lab and put it on a scale, it should weigh 175 pounds. That is literally what a square foot of this slab weighs. That's what dead load represents. I could go to this slab, cut out a, a, a one foot by one foot section of it with a saw, put it on a scale, and it should weigh 175 pounds, approximately. Okay, so we want to go and divide. Uh, so if we actually want uh, to find a, so we have our area load, and now I want to trans, uh, I want to uh, transform this into a line load that I could then use for, say, the design of my beams. So let's look at how I'm going to divide this slab, and because this is a square slab, a perfectly square slab, and I'm, I'm going to assume two-way loading, and it's gonna be nice and simple at uh, 45 degree angles, like so. Now, this is a little bit complicated and a little bit tricky in some ways because the, uh, because the load is not gonna be constant. So we are gonna end up with a triangular load like that. However, it's actually not too bad. Um, the same method of, of, of multiplying the uh, area load times the tributary width works just fine. Because really, uh, for our load diagram, all we really need to have is the peak load. And then we can do all our aesthetics with that, assuming we know it's a symmetric triangle. So we have something like this. We know that the load is going to be a symmetric triangle like this. With a width of 20 feet, how I knew it had the shape was simply looking at the uh, tributary area diagram. Um, the shape of the combined tributary area, if you just have load on one side, for example, is going to be the same as uh, the overall, uh, the section of slab that you're dividing up. And the peak value here 
is going to be 175 pounds per square foot. PSF times the, the tributary width of 10 feet. Again, we're dividing this in two. And so the maximum width right at the center of this beam is going to be 10 feet, the maximum width of that tributary area. And so that will then come to 1.75 uh, kips if we divide by 1,000. And that's it. And that would be the loading diagram of the beam. And then we could go and find our reactions very easily. And with our load diagram, we, can get, we could then find the shear and moment diagrams, uh, find deflections, and do our full beam design. Questions so far? Again, with two-way loading, we're dividing the slab up uh, at 45 degree angles. And a triangular division of the slab will result in a triangular load diagram as well. So I know this is a little tricky sometimes. It's going to be difficult to wrap your head around. Um, any questions on this? OK. If not, we will continue uh, looking at uh, some more two-way slab material. Now let us consider the uh, two-way slab again. But what if you don't have a perfectly square two-way slab? It was nice and simple with the two-way slab here because we had a perfectly square slab. So we just divided everything up into simple 45-degree uh, triangles and everything worked out fine. What about uh, two-way slabs, rectangular two-way slabs? Now, if I wanted to be a real pedant, I could say, but squares are rectangles. We're talking about rectangles that are not squares. Rectangular two-way slabs. So what if you have a slab that's something like this? Hmm. And you have beams all the way around the exterior that you need to calculate a uh, load diagrams for. How do you divide the load up then? Well, that's a little trickier. So at the corners, you start out with the same 45 degrees, and that's fine. So that would be the same 45, and the same here. But think of a point, uh, think of a point like here. Uh, load will, again, will tend to go toward the closest location or to the closest uh, element that can resist it or that can provide resistance. Think about this point right here, that this one dot here. Uh, it is actually much closer to this uh, uh, horizontal beam running in the X direction than this vertical beam running in the Y direction. So it will tend to go towards this beam here, towards the bottom beam. So when we have uh, two-way slabs that aren't perfect uh, squares, we get this kind of trapezoidal loading. So the, the shorter beams end up having simple triangular loads, and the longer beams end up having uh, trapezoidal loads. Um, they have trapezoidal, uh, they have trapezoidal tributary areas, and as a result, have trapezoidal uh, load diagrams. 
As far as uh, how you determine um, the length of this segment here, we'll just, let's think about this. Let's say you have a slab. Let's just do a little trigonometry. Let's say you have a slab with dimensions A and B, A being the shorter dimension, B being the longer dimension. Just figure that out. All we have to do is a little bit of trigonometry. So let's look at, if we wanna know this dimension, let's say we want this dimension X. How far out, what is the maximum distance? And that's gonna be really useful when calculating the load diagram for the short beam. So let's, let's just do a little check. So uh, this would be not A, but A over two, and that's this here. And then this would also be A over two, right? Uh, that would have to be A over two. That make, yeah, that would simply be A over two and A over two. And that would be a 45 degree angle and a 45 degree angle. Again, uh, it is going to be a, uh, a 45 degree triangle. So, and if this dimension is 45 is a, a, then this has to be A over two and this has to be A over two, which means uh, when then uh, determining the maximum uh, point on this, on this beam's tri uh, Triagonal, uh, triagonal, yes, uh, <laughs> triangular um, load diagram. When you need that maximum dimension, you just multiply. You would multiply by a over two, and then same here for the load diagram on. So basically, the load diagram on B. If we have a slab like this, and we want to get its load diagram, what would the load diagram for B look like? Well, you'd have something like this you'd have a trapezoidal load like this. And its maximum intensity would be A over two times your distributed load, whatever that, or your area load, whatever that P is. So I wanna work through a quick example of this for two-way loading. So let's say we have a slab that was like this. And to make it interesting, let's just say, instead of using the slab dead weight, let's say there's a live load of, I don't know, 50 pounds per square foot. And I want to find, oh, and let's say this is, I don't know, uh, 15 feet, by 40 feet. So if I want to get the, let's say I want to get the load diagram of, uh, of uh, let's label these one and two. Let's get the load diagram of one, the vertical beam. Well, that one's fairly straightforward. We know that this dimension has to be, um, has to be 7.5 or uh, 15, uh, 15 feet divided by two or 7.5 feet. So the low diagram for beam one would be something like this. So we'd have a peak of, uh, let's see, that would be 7.5 feet times 50 PSF, which that then comes to, That comes to 112.5 pounds per foot. Again, notice the transition of units. We're going from an area, a, a weight or a load per area to a load per length along the beam. If I wanted the load diagram for beam two, it would be something more like this. We would have a trapezoidal uh, load like this. And in order to perform the statics on it, we need both the dimensions and the peak load. But for the peak load, that's going to be uh, similar. We're going to have the same uh, peak load dimension of 7.5 feet times the same distributed load of 50 PSF. 
So uh, really the same, uh, the same uh, maximum load, 112.5 pounds per foot. And then you would just wanna label the dimensions as well. So, it's we, so you can perform all the statics and that would be 7.5 feet and 7.5 feet. Okay, there's that. And finally, I wanna look at uh, some rules of thumb, some guidelines on when to use one-way loading versus when to use uh, two-way loading. And that will be the final topic for today. Going a bit over to do some audio issues, but hopefully that's not too bad. Okay, so how to determine when to use each? Uh, to use one way versus two way. Uh, the basic idea here is that um, any slab can be designed for one way or two way loading. If I'm designing a reinforced concrete slab, I can design, uh, just depending how I lay the rebar out, I can, I can make uh, any slab, regardless of dimensions, be whatever I want, one way or two way loading. However, in terms of efficiency, um, long slabs um, are more efficient in, two, in one way loading. or more specifically or more specifically uh, square slabs are more are inefficient or are more efficient in 2A now how to determine uh, what what the cutoff point is well, there is a simple rule of thumb you can use, and that is if you have a slab dimension, so let me make, make clear that this is a rectangular slab, A and B, well, let's say A is the shorter and B is the longer. If A over B, or actually I should say B over A, basically the ratio of the longer to the shorter dimension. If B over A, uh, let's say if that is greater than or equal to two, uh, that's the case we're gonna wanna use one-way loading. In other words, if it's twice as long as it is wide, uh, it, that's probably a good point to assume one-way loading. And if B over A is less than two, that's a good time to assume two-way loading. And again, you can design a slab for, uh, you can design any aspect ratio slab to be one way or two way loading, just depending on how you lay out the, um, the rebar, um, at least with a concrete slab. But uh, it generally in terms of structural efficiency, the longer the slab is, it becomes more efficient to use one way loading. All right, any questions on this? Okay, all right, if there's no questions, I think I will uh, end lecture here for today. Uh, sorry for going a little bit over time. We had some audio issues, but I think we got everything taken care of. Um, if you wanna stick around, I might, if, if there's interest, I might work through some other examples of, um, uh, if there's interest during office hours and the people are available, I might work through some other examples of uh, tributary area calculations, but otherwise uh, that will do it for today, but I'll just be going into office hours now. All right, so that'll do it for now. Um, thank y'all for coming. Uh, hope to see y'all on Monday. 
And as always, thank you.